would give us information on their land use systems themselves, extraction of resources, and what products they're growing, what, what they're farming. Uh, we were able to get some funding that allowed us to do this in high class. We got the whole research vessel with a cook, which is a great way to do research, and you can just pull up to the town, uh, do sampling and do interviews. We were taking advantage of a particularly low time period in terms of uh, water levels. It made the national news because the cities in the western Amazon and all the way out to the central Amazon um, actually had deficient water supplies. The city of Iquitos was, I think, three weeks with no drinking water. Um, so one of the wettest places in the world in 2005 was actually put through water stress. In the papers, it seemed like a real disaster. When we got out there, in fact, local people living in the floodplain said, well, yeah, well, we've seen much worse than this. It's really no big deal. Where it was a big deal was in the city. So the cities turned out to be the fragile part in terms of vulnerability to climate change, not so much the folks living out here in a floodplain where you can get up to six meters of change in water in a particular flooding period. Um, I learned a whole lot by studying plants, not out in the forest, but plants that uh, farmers grow and how you grow rice is a major, is a function of the depositional processes that leave particular sediment sizes in river, um, uh, river in, in depositions that are exposed and then can be used for growing rice. Uh, it's a flood pulse system, but we noticed as we sampled on four different rivers that in fact as you pass a juncture, one river coming into another, in fact, their land use system, calendar, when they planted crops, what species they were able to plant, changed also in a, in a fashion having to do with changing from one river system to another. Vulnerability was not that great in terms of the, the changes in the river levels. People seemed to be able to adapt their system to it. Um, there was a, a master student, Amy McCleary, was able to actually map out the part of the river that's affected by these two big rivers coming together, the Marañón and the Cayale, using multi-temporal um, remote sensing to get a, a finer grain look at how those systems change through time. We found a lot of things that we're still working through in terms of how uh, the rising waters and high waters give you very different planting seasons and, and availability of resources. Um, compared to when you have descending waters or when the water at a, is at a low stage. Uh, we found that where the river was coming from, where it was connected to the Andes was really important. We would pick up El Nino records. People would say, the biggest flood that I remember, and it would be the biggest flood they remember from an El Nino year. So we actually were able to trace back an Andean connection to decisions being made down in the lowlands. Um, what's different about working with people is I went trying out my ideas on them, it's like I'm giving you some ideas and generalizations, and they would answer back and say, no, you're wrong. It's not really about the physical environment at all. I'm much more worried about pests and credit and transportation, things that I never would have considered. So that's what you got students for. So Mario Cardoso then grabbed those ideas and others, and he's actually doing systematic sampling. This is the city of Iquitos, 350,000 to 400,000 people right here. But there's land use out along the road, along the river, and different distances and different difficulties for market, and he's going to be able to say with some precision how land use decisions are changed as a function of accessibility to these big urban markets. I found then that the Andes were very important, even out in the Amazon. They control the flooding regime, but they also control the nature of the rivers, and so what you can plant and where has as much to do with where the water comes from as the flooding regime itself. Um, we found that there was an ensol record even down in the Amazon. An El Nino year in the Amazon is usually dry. Here we have massive floods. So ironically in the western Amazon you have big floods and you have little precipitation. A very different El Nino signal than has been documented in other parts of the Amazon because of the closeness to the Andes. Uh, as, we, as we moved along in our settlements, there's a very clear trend that closer or more accessible to the big city made a big difference. Um, but I also remember that as we moved away and started to incorporate the land use decisions of indigenous people like the Kandoshi that Mariana is working with, they have very different goals that may or may not be easily understandable um, in terms of what they're after. Uh, I usually go to the field to get away from cities. In this kind of work, we kept finding that 
that the city was the organizing feature on land use decisions even many days away from, in terms of travel, away from that city. Um, and then the river itself, fluvial dynamics, and that ENSO feature that comes through. This is a part of Iquitos that floods every year, the poorer part of town. Um, this part here is designed to flood, so people have their first story, and then during the high water season, they'll just move by boats from their second floor. So people can adapt. Shacks that are on pontoons float up and down in order to um, be adapted to the changes in the rivers. So in conclusion, then, I think coupled systems approaches are useful. What I like about it, especially, is the flexibility. You can do just the plant ecology part as long as you consider the possibility for complications from land use. You can do the land use part and see how it affects vegetation and land cover as long as you're sensitive to the fact that in the high Andes, anyway, you're being exposed to dramatic climate change consequences. So land use itself probably is accommodating those changes. And I would think that a coupled system approach would be the most productive one. There's going to be feedback that's going to be updated. Um, we ran into temperatures, glaciers, seasonality, and hydrological connectivity being the themes that held uh, the physical part together of the coupled systems. And institutions, livelihood, land tenure, repeatedly showing up as controls on the land use side. And the coupled system approach hopefully bringing those elements together. Thank you. changes the land cover that I'm interested in. So yes, definitely there's an active part that's meant to be of that arrow coming back and actually affecting the land cover itself. And affecting things other than just the land cover. Certainly. Yeah, well no, it's huge. I mean land land use is that you could do multiple connections to many other boxes. I've just chosen to do the land cover part that connects to vegetation. Oh, sorry. You want to do that? <laughs> But so um, one of the things that I've been hearing a lot about the global climate change is about the, you know, how glaciers along the tropics are you know, receding, like in Africa, and then you talked about them here. And one of the things that I was just curious about since you were talking about human adaptability to that, are they storing water? Are they responding to those changes by creating dams or wells? Yeah, that's one of the... Is that, and, and right. one of the is, that, is that an indicator of the local climate change? Are you using that sort of adaptability to say, okay, that's an indicator of the recession of the glacier? You saw that the two parts, are they doing that? Is that also an indicator for your research? Yeah. Well, one of the slides that got edited out to try to make this manageable in, in 40 minutes was, um, was showing an active response to not just climate change, but to limited water supply. In fact, many of the high elevation wetlands in the Andes are created by people. So there are springs that have been divert it, and, and actually a lot of the area of wetlands up there is not something that's natural, not necessarily something recent either. It's due to decisions by people, land use by people that created larger wetlands. Um, in terms of climate change specifically, it was clear in Kalkaya that they were diverting water to create larger wetlands. So they were trying to not let that water just go downstream. They were trying to capture it and use it. Um, the wetlands are really valuable for alpaca grazing. They're the most valuable grazing lands there for alpaca. So people were very much interested in controlling and increasing that. Your, your suggestion is very interesting and, and would work with some kinds of indicators. Uh, there, if you could measure things like wetlands and realize that there's a human component to it, then it could possibly be an indicator for how people are adapting. Um, more so, I think, would be that people, if they have 12 agricultural fields, are probably adapting in ways that you'd have to monitor from field to field to really pick up on what they're doing to change their crops. Yeah. Well, I was just wondering, you, in working with Lana, you had a site 
that appear to have been deglaciated some 5,000 years ago? Right. right? Uh, no, it's no.